I did not sell a company for a billion dollars. But the idea that I made more on my exit than some folks who did sell for a billion dollars, that ain't right. Welcome to Made It with Connor Tompkins. Praveen, so good to have you. Welcome to the Made It podcast. You speak my love language as far as you have had two bootstrapped exits. I think that's fantastic and, and the way to go. I think VC companies are kind of overrepresented. So I would love to hear a little bit about your exits and as well as, as Fraction. Good to have you, Praveen. Yeah, thanks for having me, Connor. Here's a fun question for you. I don't know if NVIDIA is the world's number one market cap or not yet. Like, will it be today? Will it be next week or <laughs> or whatever? But whether they're one or two, Microsoft is the world's largest bootstrap company. So that sounds like it makes no sense, right? Bill Gates and co, they only ever sold 5% of Microsoft before IPO. And in Gates telling, they did that to have an adult in the room. That was the only reason. They were always cash flow positive. I never wrote off investment, but my point of view was that I was going to hold off because if I run a profitable company without it, then I can raise one hell of a round whenever I got around to it, right? Having an adult in a room, sure. With NVIDIA, he put a lot into that company. Like it was like on the razor edge so many different yeah. times, some pretty big bets. It's very uncomfortable. I would probably say that, that is that being bootstrapped can be more uncomfortable than than having five million in the bank and and watching that that burn rate like a hawk. For sure. You know, you've got to got to make it happen with what you got. And I think that I honestly I thought about it the same way. I think as you Connor, like when we were building, you know, Hidden Levers, my last company, we didn't intentionally we didn't say, hey, we're never going to raise capital. In fact, I, I would I would tell the team at various points, I would say, hey, if we can get to a point where it's just add money and watch it grow, like if we've got, we feel like everything's repeatable and scalable and we're just ready to do that. Finally, we get to the the end game. If I fast forward toward the end game, we considered we're like, should we raise a growth PE round at this point? So at that point, we're doing about almost eight and a half in ARR. We wanted to get past 10 million and get to 20 million ARR, get, get to whatever the next step might be. But we could see that our growth was slowing because it's sort of law of large numbers. We had been growing for at 60% a year on average for quite a number of years at that point. So, hey, when you're up past eight or eight and eight and a half, 60% is $5 million in new sales the next year, right? And we're like, how do we do that? <laughs> and so the answer was, maybe we need to spin up an enterprise sales team. Here's the funny part. We go and we pitch a PE firm for growth equity. You know, they, they actually were the ones expressed interest. So we go and we're like, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll have this pitch. And we're like, okay, we're thinking 50, half liquidity and half, you know, so $25 million into the company. And liquidity for those listening, that means money in my pocket, my co-founder's pocket. The funny part was this. Then they're like, okay, what's your use of proceeds? And we look at each other and we're like, wait, we didn't actually think about what we'd use the money for. Or we had such a bad answer. We're like, that that's proof that you are not like you don't know how to raise money. Because we didn't know how to answer the most basic question. And here's the other thing. At that point, we were cash flowing about four million a year and not spending yeah. that. So what exactly right. are like, it's like, it's almost like, wait, if you're cash flowing 4 million a year, any investor should logically be asking you, wait, shouldn't you spend that money first? Like, why are you cash flowing 4 million a year? You're not reinvesting in your own business. Were you taking it out in the form of distributions or were you just leaving it in as like the massive, like rainy day fund for the company? We were founded, you know, in 2010. And so this is before the law changed. So you see everywhere, like now you go on um, whatever site you want to use. What do you get? You get a Delaware C Corp. And why do you get a dollar C Corp? Because that's what VCs want, you know, from an investment perspective. And also, to be fair, if you grow that C Corp and you have an exit five years later, then the first 10 million is, you know, per founder is tax free, right? In gross. But we're talking about QSBS, right? Which is we're talking about QSBS for first time founders. And a lot of people, whenever they have their first exit and then they hear about QSBS, they get really upset because they're like, I wish I knew about this sooner. And so it's a little bit of a gray area. But right now, mm -hmm. the way it stands is that investors can also take part in QSBS. Yes. And then you can do right. QSBS stacking where yep. if you have a trust, you can say, like, um, my son, my daughter, my wife, that's 40 million yep. tax free or two X. Yeah. As long as you want to break the trusts out under different names. Yep. Right. Yeah. And help me. Is it, um, there's also another way it's whatever's greater between 10 million 
or um, whatever the input is on the QSBF. Yeah, there's a, I, and I'm forgetting that formula, but yeah, there's a return on the invested capital, like up to a certain point. It usually works out that the 10 million is the larger of the two numbers, though, I think, based on the formula. I feel like I had to like point that out just because I think it's the first time it's come up on the podcast and it might be worth adding to the show notes that if you guys are interested in QSBS. There's some really good free articles, meaning like the law firms have written up, like explaining in detail, even explaining the whole packing and stacking and like all the the hijinks one can play. But I'll actually go back to that to say why it didn't end up being bad for us that we were an LLC taxed as an escort. Now, rewinding, the law changed in 2012 and then maybe got a little more favorable a little bit after that. But we predated that. So we didn't actually get to change, to take advantage of QSBS because it didn't exist when we were incorporated. And so and actually, you have to have been incorporated after a certain date. So we were an escort, which again, for folks who don't know, if you're a profitable company, then the money just comes straight back to the shareholders. There is no corporate light layer of taxation. It just goes right back to you, whatever tax rate you pay. And oh, by the way, there is based on the more recent tax cuts, the 20, whatever, 17 tax cuts, you get a 20% discount on your taxes that you pay relative to like if you just had a job and you had a W-2. So it's pretty favorable in that sense. So yes, and, and long answer to your question, we were sweeping out that cash flow. So that four million, I, I cleared like two and a half that year or something, just in in my pocket. And why were we doing that? We were. It wasn't to say that we weren't reinvesting in the company. We were, but at the same time, I think the same mentality that gets you there as a bootstrapper. I will say there's an element of it that can be. I was talking to my co-founder Raj, and we were looking back, and we're like. Yeah, we should have reinvested more. But it was the scrappiness that got us there that gave us that sort of scrappy save it all gene. <laughs> so maybe when we got to the point where we were really cash flowing quite a lot, we were still being conservative. Also, where does that money go? Like if you have a really good CAC channel for like a paid media, you're like, put everything into it. If you know that you're going to get $2 out for every one that you put yeah. in, why not put that for and to get another eight out. But it, it depends. And sometimes channels get saturated. And just because you put yeah. more money into it doesn't mean it's going to pay off like that. For sure. I mean, we were B2B SaaS. And to be a little more specific now, I haven't said what, what on earth did this company Hidden Levers do? Well, in a nutshell, we built software that helped financial, financial advisors answer questions from their clients. Questions like, what happens to my portfolio if interest rates actually go up more because like inflation is bad? Or what happens to my portfolio if you know, there's like a war going on in the Middle East, as everybody knows right now. What if that gets worse? What if it like spirals out of control? What happens if, uh, you know, depending on which way the election goes, all sorts of global macro political scenarios, these can affect our investments. And so financial advisors are always getting these kinds of questions. But we built software to help them model out different scenarios. And, and that's what we sold uh, into that market. So yeah, from a B2B SaaS sales perspective, we were selling it to a, a niche. There's sort of a limit to, you know, how much you can saturation bomb. I think we were probably emailing 300,000 people a week, you know, by wow. the end there. And that's in the era when email marketing was still really, you know, the, the delivery to inboxes was still working to an extent. <laughs> it wasn't as hard as it is today. Which we were just talking about before we jumped on the call. It's not looking good out there for the world of, of email marketing. You kind of have to pair it with some other stuff. In this world of generative AI and just sort of content, the cost of producing content I don't want to say the cost of producing good content, but the cost of producing content is dropping, <laughs> well, let's say marginal content, a good enough content has fallen. And so that just means that the supply of it, the volume of it out there is exploding. And so then we're all drowning in it. And so we can all think about this personally, like, would I take that call? Would I read that email, you know, or that spammy message on LinkedIn or wherever they're getting to me. And so, yeah, so it's gotten harder in some ways. It goes to show that if you can add friction to your own process in a way, friction as in like meeting people face to face, like doing some of the things that don't necessarily scale, there's kind of a counter movement where if you can do that well and build a more intentional outreach and relationship with people, we've all heard these things, but it's going to be more valuable now. Paid communities are kind of a barrier to social media platforms that are overly saturated. In-person meetups right. are different from email. It's it's going to be a little bit of a, of a counter pendulum. I want to move back to Hidden Levers because the name is fantastic and, and fun because it instantly makes you ask a bunch of questions. You ran this for 10 years and you, you grew it to a pretty decent sized revenue. And you had like a 13, 16 X multiple on this exit that you had. So it was like a nine figure healthy exit for you guys. How did you sell the business? Did you go through a full broker process? Did you know the buyer ahead of time? 
How did you end up going through that decision? Great question. And so, yeah, so 16X Rev, you know, is where we where we landed. You know, speaking, I was I was talking about that before about the 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 theory or the thought of like raising growth capital, and that was at the same time we were we were considering our options because here we are, we're doing pretty well. You know, we've got great cash flow, as I mentioned, but we're looking forward and we're seeing that oh man, our year over year comps are just going to get harder. Can we really sustain this pace of growth? And it was becoming more clear that it was going to take more enterprise sales to do that, you know, to really continue to to grow at that same pace, at least in our case, because what we were seeing was that our typical sort of SMB ticket was call it six or 7,000 a year. We were not seeing a path to glomming together enough sales of that size. Like we weren't seeing like, where are we getting a thousand of those sales in order to get like six or 7 million in net new revenue? That was a lot harder than, you know, because we were starting to close deals that were north of 100K as well. So like, okay, we need to lean yeah. into that. And and that seemed like it was going to be a big lift to really make that happen at scale. So we started asking ourselves this question. Well, again, do we want to raise gross equity and see if we can build a, I don't know, an enterprise sales team and have all the have all the guys up in New York trying to knock on the doors of larger financial institutions to try to sell up market? Or is it time to sort of land this plane? So that was, that was our decision. And... Um, we decided to go to market, you know, in the end, we were like, hey, we're 10 years in. You ever get the feeling kind of like startups? I feel like they age in dog years. Oh, geez. I don't know if it's fast or slow, but yeah, I feel dog years for sure. It's like because your original tech is now a decade old. You've got to refresh your whole tech stack to be up to date or even your IP. Like even uh, actually, let's say we had never sold. Right. Play that out. So Hidden Levers was built on let's the best of kind of financial analytics and modeling when I started, 2010, maybe 2011, fast forward by a decade, if I didn't rebuild the model using machine learning, then somebody was going to overtake it. So I would have had to do that. I punched the ticket before I had to do that, <laughs> but uh, but that was going to be a necessary investment. So so you know your your tech doesn't last forever. That that's sort of one one factor. And the and the team gets tired. If we're honest about it, right? Like so, folks are waiting on their exit. And uh, at some point, not just the founders, but the team as a whole. So that was also a factor that played into just making the decision to move that way. It's hard because like a lot of times you don't know when the company is going to sell as an employee. It's a, it's a mystery box, right? And you're like, am I going to be holding on to this forever? Or is this going, what is this going to look like for me? So it's, it's nice that they were at least able to have that exit and have that experience as well. It was an interesting story for us, actually. So in answer to the question of how we approached M&A, we did retain bankers. I think that was a good decision in our case, even though one of our largest partners ended up buying us. So we could have picked up the phone and called the same folks and started that conversation. And they would have been happy to have the conversation. But this sort of uh, veneer of a competitive bidding process was helpful from a valuation perspective and talking to other potential buyers. Even though theirs was the highest bid in the end, because they were the most strategically interested. You guys were getting a multiple on your revenue, let alone your a multiple on your EBITDA, which is like something like uh, some magic, like witchcraft voodoo stuff that I, I absolutely love. And I, I'm also not sure if it's like realistic in the future, because it seems like those, those are traditionally saved for like SaaS companies and and some of these like very big margin businesses and SaaS companies, I think might be struggling in the next few years. So you timed it pretty well. So I was mentioning that we were in the macro, you know, financial analytics game, right? So we were looking at markets and looking at valuations. And that also played into our decision that, hey, the getting is good right now. So it's time. But I'll say this on valuation. So we, yes, we, we priced it 16x rev, but that was also given that uh, our pre-tax profit margins were over just over 50%. Our EBITDA multiple was just double that. So it's 32X, which is not low. That's a, that's a high multiple from that perspective as well. But here's the interesting part. Interest rates were low in that time frame, right? So our buyer mm -hmm. actually went to the debt market and they, they went and they borrowed the money to buy us because it was principally a cash deal. They go and raise the money to buy us and lock in a low interest rate, buy our company. And the deal was what's called in financial parlance accretive. So that means that the day the deal closed, our buyer became more profitable with us than without us. That is very rare when acquiring a tech company. Usually it's like, oh crap, the burn rate. So now the CFO is sitting there and looking at like, oh, how much more money is going out the door? But so for them to buy, like in my mind, that was why I felt at the end of the day that, hey, it was a good financial deal. And it wasn't like, there were some deals from 2021 that like stink pretty bad right now. Mm -hmm. and, and we were one of those because we raised their profitability the day they bought us and they got the tech. 
So it's almost like getting the tech for free. You're actually raising your profitability as well. That's awesome. That's actually a solid exit for you, solid exit for them. Hey, podcast listeners, if you guys are interested in cold email outbound outreach that actually works or thought leadership and how to build a community around some of the things that you're working on, I highly recommend incendiumstrategies.com. They're not just sponsoring this podcast, but they're also helping us with a lot of the communities that we run on the back end. Uh, so if that's something that resonates with you guys and you're interested in learning more, check out incendiumstrategies.com. Thank you guys. And back to the pod. Did you have an earnout for a period of time? One year. So just some, no- it was relatively nominal, like a couple percent, like I think it was maybe 4% of the deal, which is tied to making sure that we did our job on the tech integration and like sort of like connecting it all together. I was looking at like the top five bootstrap businesses that more recent, right? And so we had MailChimp which we brought up with with Ben Chestnut. I think it was acquired for around $12 billion by by Intuit. I want to say roughly when you guys got acquired. There's Spanx, so Sarah Blakely, big, big company. Um, GitHub, Plural Insights, and Balsamic. So, I mean, that's a pretty big, that's a pretty good list. And most of them are in tech, except for Spanx. Two out of the five are from Atlanta, actually. And we do talk about how when you're on the coast, like, and I and I talk to folks that I went to school with, whether it's, of course, Silicon Valley, but also on the East Coast with New York, Boston, the VC sort of the aura of that culture, it permeates everything. It's so pervasive that I could lay out the math for somebody and they'll be like, okay, yeah, no, I'm working on my next, I'm working on my raising my round. It just, it doesn't. And any, the funny thing is, of course, there are plenty of VC backed founders that will go on to great success and to have great outcomes. But when you look at quite often, this is the crazy part to me. Okay. So this is the crazy part. The crazy part to me is that I was able to sell a company. I did not sell a company for a billion dollars, but the idea that I made more on my exit than some folks who did sell for a billion dollars. That ain't right. And that's that's the VC machine having taken all of the oxygen before anything was left. That's the magic of the waterfall, guys. If you ever hear about preferred and, and you're trying to understand where your options are in relation to everyone else that joined the cap table later, you guys need to pay attention to that. And it happens all the time. We're in this group of, of a bunch of post-exit founders, like 2,000 of them. And you hear about these fantastic exits from a number side, and then you actually get into the mechanics of like, where are they at financially? And it's not always great, right? Candidly, I think for also from my standpoint, I just didn't want to spend the time of raising. Like I wanted to spend that time focusing on the business. I didn't want to be pitching. I didn't want to be chasing so much as I wanted to kind of grow my business and eventually be be chased whenever the time was right. How does this change where you're at now? Because you you had a bootstrap company, you have Fraction, but how does that change how you invest? How does it change how you start companies? Do you invest in startups? And if so, do you invest mostly in companies that are are very profitable or do you go for big swings? Well, that, that, that's a, it's a good question. I So I've done some angel investing. I've done enough angel investing to actually realize that it's probably not a core skill set. And, and if I say why... What are you actually investing in, right? Whenever you you make an angel investor, the truth is you're investing in people, that founding team, and it's sort of a trusting. And so then the question comes, well, what are you really judging? Because you see like the technology behind the pitch and you see sort of maybe like the business metrics that they're presenting at that moment in time. But that's not accounting for all of the future twists and turns that every team goes through. And so really you're investing in those people and will they get past all the twists and turns to make it someplace good? I'm too much an optimist. <laughs> and, you know, I'll believe the stories that I hear. And I'll, I'll be rooting for all of these teams. But fundamentally, it is about being a judge of character. I don't think I'm a very good one, if I'm honest. That wasn't that wasn't the strength that I brought to the Hidden Levers team. That was much more my co-founder, you know, who had that sort of like, let's dig deeper. Let's ask questions that are uncomfortable, you know, and I'm not I'm, I don't know that I'm that guy. That's probably caused me to like curtail it a little bit. I want to be involved, too. Like, I want to be I want to help a little bit more than than what might be normal. And I, I kind of want to build that like ecosystem, right? So if you're a VC or if you're just focusing on right, cutting that check, you don't have much control over that outcome. You have a, a shot and a prayer and, and hope everything goes okay. Hey, podcast listeners, this is Nate from the Made It Podcast. Wanted to reach out to any uh, founders, growth marketers, sales leaders listening. We've made a community just for you and we wanted to invite you to join. We have growth playbooks for you to use instructional events a few dozen every month to learn how to use the latest technology, uh, even some free services that can be helpful to help your company grow. The first thousand people to join are free. We've created a link. You can click on it in the bio for this episode. We hope to join us over our community. Tell me about Fraction. How did that start off? So the backstory of Fraction 
is that that is how we built hidden levers to no small extent. And actually, if I rewind to before the starting of hidden levers, because, you know, when we talk about bootstrapping, then there logically is a question that some folks will ask, well, how are they even able to bootstrap, right? Where did, how are they paying the rent, so to speak? Part of the answer for me was that really three years prior to starting the company, I was doing consulting on the side of my day job, but I did that for three years straight. And I was building up a war chest in a way because I knew that when I next started a company, by that point, I had a young family whenever I started Hidden Lever. So I wasn't, you know, sort of the 20 year old founder at that point. So I needed to have some, you know, a cushion. So I built that up by myself being a fractional engineer. So I knew that I could achieve what clients needed, you know, in my spare capacity, even before I started the company. So now I start hitting levers and we shake, we get up and going and we're bootstrapped. So we need to conserve on capital. After we started to get some cash in the door, get revenue going, it was at that point when we needed to start hiring and organically it just happened that way. We couldn't afford to hire. Actually, I think the first fractional hire we made technically was a sales guy. So our first, our first sales guy, Steve, he was tending bar to help pay his bills because our base salary wasn't good enough. So in a sense, it was technically fractional. Then he was building his commissions up to where he could do it full time. But uh, so that's one example. But once we had a little more revenue and we hire our first engineer, so now I'm not the only engineer. What I decided to do was I asked a guy that I knew who I'd you know, worked with in the past. I knew that he was at a boring day job. Like I knew that he had spare capacity. So I said, hey, do you want to work half time for us? So I threw out a number that effectively I knew was a discount to what he was making in his main job. But because it was a sideline for him, I was like, yeah, sure, I'll do that. So we actually got access to talent for a discount on an hourly basis with the, you know, now granted, you might say, oh, that's a friend. And so that's like a sweetheart deal, right? So that worked out. So this guy said, hey, he was our original integration engineer, and he built a lot of software integrations with our partners. He ended up staying for nine years, doing it half time on the side, never joined us full time. With that success, we started as we were building our team, of course, Actually, even the guy who became our CTO started fractionally. And then as we had success with him, you know, he ended up coming in full time. But by the time we finished building that team, there were, we had 12 developers on the Hidden Levers team. Five of the 12 were fractional. So like half time. You guys stumbled on this flexible work trend because it's interesting. Like what trends are you guys leaning on, right? The moaning their time a little bit more, right? And having that flexibility is a, is a big deal. I also see like a lot more outsourcing, but you guys are focused solely on the United States, right? We are. We're focused solely on U.S. talent. And so what was the reason for focusing on U.S. talent? Was it where you felt the most comfortable? Did you want to make sure that there was like communication in line in the same time zone? What was the reason for that? A, a little bit of all of it, but I've actually distilled it down and I literally wrote something that I Total coincidence dropped today on LinkedIn, two words, tacit knowledge. So I'm, and, and if and when Fraction expands, you know, so so Fraction, you know, as a company that came out of this experience at, at, Hidden, at Hidden Levers where we succeeded with fractional talent, after selling that company, because we had so much success with it, decided to start a firm that effectively, uh, you know, promotes it as a marketplace for fractional talent. Now, why US only then and now? Tacit knowledge as in, we'll hear things from real clients, like the developer didn't know, you know, that a zip code doesn't have letters in it because postal codes in most of the world do just little things like this or, or that, you know, just how uh, dangerous it is to let a social security number leak and how much financial implication there is that all of these little things and no one of them is probably important to your business, but chances are somewhere in the tacit knowledge of a person living and growing up, or not even growing up, but living in the U.S. for some amount of time, they will have picked up all kinds of knowledge, some of which is likely valuable to your business and to the experience of clients, which they can they can walk in their shoes a little bit more. So that we found is really the big distinction. What are some of the companies that you're working with now that are are pretty exciting names and logos that are using fractional work? You'll see that it's mostly startups. It's mostly smaller firms. Uh, so not necessarily like household names. If I were to kind of point out industries, we work with a number of health tech companies and based on our own background, a number of companies sort of in the wealth tech, fintech space as well. But yeah, we found that our sweet spot is companies that are anywhere between one and 10 million ARR. So they're sort of scaling okay. themselves, maybe a little smaller on the, on the low end. We find, we found that, you know, sometimes we'll get founders coming in literally on day one. 
And that can be a little challenging because they don't have any revenue yet. And so that's, equity is more likely the currency they have to pay with, you know, and that's what you use to get a co-founder. So that's probably a little bit early. But just after that, once there's real revenue in the door, you know, we're able to help. And, uh, and it, yeah, it's a lot of startups because when you think about larger companies, like, oh, you guys should work with X, Y, or Z larger company. Our experience thus far has been anybody with an HR department is probably too big for us to work with <laughs> just because it's too new and different what we're doing. It helps you hone in a little bit. You're like, oh, they have an HR title. All right, let's, uh, maybe we shift, you know, somewhere else. Is there anything else that gets you excited as far as like a business idea? Is it could be something that you're working on personally or something that, it may be adjacent to you. I spent a decade in sort of, you know, fintech and wealth tech. And when I was done there, I was, I had no problem signing the non-compete because I was like, you know, I'm probably not going to work in this industry just because I think there's, there's enough to life that, you know, you want to try something different. So now, of course, with Fraction working sort of the HR space, I'm also pursuing another idea adjacent to this. So with Fraction, we're working with experienced senior talent. My other venture at the moment is called Schools Over. And actually, uh, it, it is live in a very raw alpha form at schoolsover.org. This is predicated on the idea that roughly 4 million kids graduate from high school every year. Over half don't go to college. And of the ones that do go to college, a, a nice chunk of that, not, not a nice chunk, a bad chunk, unfortunately, don't graduate. So like two thirds of kids. So help me, like in the very beginning, this is like a, an apprenticeship? Essentially, uh, what I found in my exploration of the, of the sort of job search space is that there really aren't any good ways for kids to find apprenticeships and all of the sort of pathways into, I don't know, becoming a plumber, an electrician, a tradesperson, a solar roof installer. There's lots of good careers out there for folks that don't want to go to college. In fact, there are more of those at the moment, arguably, than there are like at some caps out of college. And yet there's no really good search engines for that. There's no really good, no good explanations of the pathways. You know, building a site that analyzes, also that analyzes the data to show folks, well, hey, if you go get an associate's in nursing, this is the, the lifetime value of that degree. You have it on your site as far as like, here's the highest ROI for non-college career options. Here's the highest ROI for two-year programs or for four-year right. programs. So it's early days with that one, but I'm, I'm very excited by it. I think that it's an underserved market. It, if you look at the dollars, both... In the startup space in ed tech, so much of it, maybe it's because it's like tunnel vision because most of us, you know, we went to college and so we don't, we're not looking at the full picture, but everybody is serving that same audience. And I don't, and I think that this audience is very much underserved and yet there's a ton of opportunity there. The employers, so let's, let's take a concrete, super concrete example, auto mechanic. Then I'll give you a concrete example of why I think it's even a good business idea. Search for auto mechanic on Indeed. You will find tons of job listings. The problem is, now, now check the entry-level checkbox. You'll still find tons of job listings. But how many of the job listings under the entry-level checkbox are actually entry-level? It turns out it's a bit of a mess that nobody has really bothered to curate this and to create a pipeline in to those kinds of jobs that are actually accessible, even though they do exist. So that's really part of the goal. You're focusing on data first, it seems like. Like you're, you're focusing on congregating information What's the next step? How are you going to help connect them and yeah. facilitate? So this is sort of like pre, this is pre sort of real launch. It's just sort of out there. Um, but the next step is pulling in jobs data alongside all this sort of college data and uh, using Gen AI to analyze it a, a little bit further to determine that, hey, these are really entry level positions that are suitable. And then analyzing those jobs to have yeah. them directly compared. So like, okay, if you go get an entry level auto mechanic, you know, intern, uh, job at, you know, the local Toyota dealership, what's that career path look like? And how does that compare with going and getting that to your nursing degree? Those things that can be directly compared. And so that's sort of the education and kind of info we want to bring to, to kids. Uh, but I have no doubt that if that is successful, you know, in conveying that information and getting kids, you know, to sort of consume that, that creating the pathways for them to go directly to employment and then being part of that transaction is easy. I think some of the better high school programs that you see are the ones that have the farm tech kind of like certification inside there, the automotive tech, the culinary license in schools. So it's, it's cool that you're focusing on like on job training piece of this. And I like things when there's like a disconnect between what society values and what might actually be the value. Like right. then you're, you're finding something because it used to be that it was very valuable to become a lawyer or a doctor. Those are like the two things that we put up on a pedestal. And if you're a doctor, then you go through four years of undergrad and racking up debt, then four years of med school racking up debt. And then 
uh, three to five years of residency getting paid like 60,000 while that debt is accumulating, that opportunity cost is pretty substantial. Yeah. It's interesting to be able to see that and maybe challenge that a little bit. I would love for you for more people to become doctors, we need more of them. But if you look at like the inflationary increase and how things might be changing it from an opportunity cost standpoint, it might not make sense to be a lawyer. If nothing else, I think that having better information out there for families or kids, I feel like the worst I'll do is put a good, good informational resource out there in the world. But I suspect that with any success at all, I think that there's an eight or nine figure exit in that one too, you know, and so I think it's worth pursuing. And, and although it's named schoolsover.org, that is a for-profit exercise as well. I think that's the best way to make it sustainable, it, you know, is for it to have, you know, to be tied back to business and to delivering on, uh, you know, company's needs. So I'm excited to see how this works. I think it's interesting that you're working on both sides of the spectrum as far as these senior level, high paid positions, but then you're also looking at these other kind of opportunities that are on the other side of the spectrum. Anything else that you're up to? I, I feel like I need to ask more questions around your side projects. That's probably as, as much as I, as much time as I can steal from family at this point, <laughs> you know, but uh, yeah, that's, that's what's keeping me busy. I think we all ask ourselves, you know, that question, but you know, that's why when I look at this schools over project, it is exciting because it's something that I think there's an element of societal need there, which somehow hasn't been met. And, and hopefully that's that becomes possible. Even on the fraction side, by the way, like I am very much a fractional work evangelist. I feel, feel like it is part of the future of work, this flexibility that you mentioned, right? I think that that's an important, um, that's an important goal in its own right. And honestly, if I achieve nothing else in my pursuit of growing fraction as a business, if I achieve nothing else than normalizing fractional work at large companies or at more companies, then that will have been a success. And, and the cool thing is, is that that's tied together with the company's success. <laughs> and so, hey, if I can, if I can achieve both of those, that's great. I think there's a little bit of a gap in the market where you hear about people working at multiple different companies, but what tools are there to help that person keep track of where they're working, when, and their benefits and accessing payroll and stuff like that? I'm setting aside the people that are working three full-time jobs for now, but like I'm talking about the people that are working at multiple different places. They're not really a system set up for the companies and for that person. And so I do feel like that that will be established at some point where it's a little bit more set up. Interesting to me that when you look at big companies, for instance, you look at sort of the Fortune 500 or whatever, just major companies in the United States, although they pay lip service to the idea that, oh, yeah, we're, we, you know, we're cool with flexible work and all of these things, the number of part-time roles listed is de minimis. And so there's sort of this belief that, oh, there's no way that anyone could ever do this job, you know, in 20 hours or 25 hours or do a chunk of this job. I think we exist to challenge that because I don't think it's true. And in our exp practical experience, we found it to not be true. I fully support the future of work. So one of the questions I asked you in the beginning is if you were to title this episode, if you were to give it a hook, what do you think that hook would be? Probably something to do with how Praveen grew his startup to a nine-figure exit fractionally something like that i would i would tie in certainly the fractional element because we used that fractional work big exit or something like that something like, like that like, yeah, yeah yeah where should people go to find you higherfraction.com i mentioned the schoolsover.org that's sort of very much a work in progress we'll get we'll we'll get something for an official launch maybe the next month or so but yeah higherfraction.com yeah we uh we definitely to the extent that there's entrepreneurs out there looking for looking for help we've got efficient ways to help do it awesome Praveen. i, I really appreciate it all right guys that's a pod Cheers. Yeah, thanks for the time, Connor. That wraps up today's episode. For more inspiring stories and valuable lessons from successful entrepreneurs, be sure to listen and subscribe wherever you get podcasts. Thanks for listening. Until next time, keep pushing boundaries and writing your next chapter.